All right, welcome back to Nano Dosing. We got a, a special guest coming in in a little bit. It's Scott Rogowski, Quiz Daddy from HQ Trivia. You might remember him from your phone, from looking at him on your phone for uh, probably, uh, what would you say, like the height of HQ Trivia was the fall, winter of 2018, mm -hmm. sometime yep. around then? Like, yeah. Really popped off. Did you guys ever win any money on it? I won once, and it was like four dollars or something i don't recall if i ever got it or like because there was a whole thing you had to go through to claim it and i think i may have just like not done it but i won once you still won yeah. how big was that rush oh it was incredible it was the best winning that four dollars felt better than like i don't know a lot of stuff i've done four hundred dollars like winning that that four dollar only because you were competing against sometimes over a million people when we did that um Black Friday thing, the soccer goalie thing. I won two grand. Winning the four dollars felt better. What uh, about when uh, you got nutmegged? I mean, the, that's fine. I got two grand. Yeah. Do you remember that though? Well, when you got I got nine hundred and forty dollars because you know, because Joe, because mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. President Brandon. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you got nutmegged. Was it Alex Bennett that nutmegged you? Yeah. I mean, that was the only place she could have gone. She she placed it perfectly. Wow. Crazy. That's that's one of my favorite clips. Watching your head just bow down in defeat afterwards. Yeah, the two saves never made it on. That was interesting. <laughs> they didn't. People don't people don't like to see you they, succeed. They shout your failures and whisper your accomplishments. That's fine. That's absolutely right. Uh, so welcome back, everybody. Everyone have a good weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good mm -hmm. weekends all around. Mm -hmm. Anything interesting happen? PLL. Oh, yeah. Championship yeah. series. I gave out the winning pick. I gave you everybody Chrome plus 400 to win it all, and they did. So just wanted to put that out there. All right. Nice job, Billy. And and you were undefeated in chugging challenges, right? Not exactly. A um, bunch of heavyweights came out. They're the only ones people remember. Whisper your accomplishments. Shout your failures. Mm -hmm. I did beat Paul Rabel in a chugging contest. That was pretty cool. Paul doesn't strike me as a beer guy. He's not a beer chuggy. Paul Rabel is a, a martini sipping. <laughs> He's high class. I've been getting into martinis recently, actually. Martinis are, there's something that you absolutely hate when you start drinking, and then you just grow to love them as, as your taste kind of changes. Do you like years. them extra dry? Yeah, what's, what's, how do you order? I like dirty. Okay. Dirty. dirty. Down in, in Mexico, I was getting martinis before dinners, and I would, I would say mucho sucio. The Sucioist. I want the Sucioist martini. Filthy, dirty. I yeah. learned that like an extra dry martini is literally just a cup of vodka. And I was like, what the fuck? With an olive in it, yeah. 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 Not even like, you could get it extra dry, no olives. And it's literally just a cup of vodka. And it's like, that is what they did in Soviet Russia, but mm -hmm. you're just like using different terminology to make it fancy. Yeah. Does it still have vermouth in it if it's extra dry or no? I think it might have like a little bit of vermouth in it, mm -hmm. but... I don't know. It just depends on on how dry you want it. The uh, the the Russians, yeah, they know how to drink. I mean, it, the fall of the Soviet Union, they talk about these guys would get their like, you know, vodka stipend and just like drink a cup of vodka a night, and like it was like the fall of the Soviet Union. That's all they were doing. Listen for more takes on on Billy's uh, <laughs> post mortem on Soviet Union. I mean, but by the way, really quick. Uh, Made some comments about Ukraine <laughs> last week. I just wanted to say, if I like, I've participated in Ukraine fundraisers when it first all came out. Some of his best friends are Ukrainian. Actually, yes. Uh, I, <laughs> he was, I was at just, the marches. <laughs> I was just saying geopolitically, like, you know. Like, let's hear Putin out. No, no, like, <laughs> it wasn't like we didn't stir up. Like, not everybody's innocent. Yeah. So wait, what? What are you? What are you saying? What are you saying again? Because I, you tried to apologize for it, but then you just went right back into. But we were asking for it. The no, no, the Americans were asking for it. Okay. And the, unfortunately, the Ukrainian people became the victims. Okay. Slob so Ukraine. I want them to win. I'm rooting. In conclusion, blue and yellow. Hunter Biden still responsible for the war. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to clear that up. <laughs> wanted to clear that up. Uh. All right, Billy, comrade Billy, um, you were, to Billy's credit, you were falling for all the propaganda when it when it happened. You yeah, were like, I was like, yo, the ghost, ghost of, of Kiev. Yeah, Billy was like, the ghost of Kiev is so real. 
and I had to school him about the the art of modern warfare. Fuck you, warfare. you me. <laughs> it's impossible for that guy to have done what they said that he did in that first day. Um, so, all right, thank you, Billy, for your apology. I appreciate I'm not that. apologizing. I'm just saying, of course not. Yeah. That like I'm not like Putin's sympathist. It's just like there was a lot going on. If you had a gun, I'd if, kill Putin. If I'm Putin right now, uh -huh. and you had Bang. a gun, even, I don't even let you talk. Even knowing that you would get arrested and thrown in jail. No, because once he dies, it's like it's like that movie where if you kill the one guy, they all like disappear. Oh yeah, Night King, Game of Thrones. I kill you, like everything just dissolves. Okay, <laughs> that's how it works. Yeah, but but Billy, you kill Putin. That's probably a few few million dollars in Hunter Biden's pocket. Who cares? Okay, it'll be gone within the week. That's very him. that's very true. No, I kill <laughs> I kill Putin. The Russians respect the fuck out of me for being like strong man. And make me king. Then you become Putin. No. The new Putin. I. If Billy was in charge of the Soviet Union, excuse me, Russia. Russia, if Billy, the Federation. If Billy was in charge of Russia, what would what would your goals be for, for uh, the future of the entire Federation and the nation? Ooh, this is actually a very good, very good idea. What do you do with the oligarchs? You know what I would do? I'd straight up just liberate all the small like states that have been under rule and just let them have their own countries. Like give Georgia, let Georgia be a country. No, Georgia is a country. It is a country. They invaded Georgia. Just like there's a bunch of little cool places in Russia that I, ever since like I've been reading up more about because of like UFC and like just reading about the conflict. Like there's like a straight up like so many different cultures in Russia that we just have no idea because they've been under the blanket of Russia. You would give the Chechens a seat at the table. Yeah. Well, I'd give them their own country. Okay. So then the oligarchs would definitely kill you. No, yeah, but I killed Putin, so they respect me. Mm, I think they'd still kill you. They'd 100% they kill would, me. You would be dead within a day. Yeah. I, I Maybe even less. Maybe maybe within the hour. No, And yeah. not because they're mad about Putin, but because they're like, this Billy guy, He's he's got some ideas. He's of woke. Freedom. Billy's woke, and he's going <laughs> to give all the ethnic minorities their own country. <laughs> and so we just can't have that because we have to sell oil yeah. and minerals. But then I'd let those like ethnic minorities sell their own oil and then enrich themselves. Would you tax them? No, absolutely not. Yeah, you'd be dead. They would, yeah. Yeah. Billy, Billy would be dead. Uh, Big T, good weekend for you? It was average. That's good. It was perfectly fine. Bi yeah, Big T loves average weekends. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I would almost rather they be average than good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, because average is comfortable. Yeah, it's it's good, it's fine. But then if you have like a great weekend, you come into work on Monday and and you hit a, you crash. Yeah, you're coming off a high. So now you're just you're all fresh. Yeah, if you if you have a perfectly average weekend, you don't really nothing really happens, then you you're fine. That is yeah. the most conservative statement I've ever heard. In conservative, in the original sense of the word, like no fun because it might cause something bad to happen in the future. Yeah, it's kind of, honestly a crazy take, big. <laughs> no, I, I like it. It's I like slow that. and steady. Wins the race. I don't know. I love great weekends, man. But you look you forward to it all average week. Average is great. You look forward to it all week and it's just consistency. Average. But if you have a great weekend every weekend, then it's not great anymore. I'm not saying every weekend. Like you're gonna have an average weekend. I did. I didn't do much this weekend, but like next this week this coming weekend I'm going to Florida. The like, average weekends wait. are what make the great ones great. Oh, but you don't even want great ones. But I, I think, no, I do but, every once. It sounded in a while. like you were saying okay. that you just prefer an average weekend all the time. I said, I said almost, but not. Uh, but you have you get nine average, and then the one good is really good. Oh, okay. Then I would take that. Yeah. So it's yeah. like it, I mean the the UT win against Alabama. Big T is going to be riding high off that for years to come. Right. Okay. It was I thought such you a great just, weekend. Yeah. I thought you just meant like average all the time. You'd prefer. No, you you want good thrown in there, but okay. but at a you know where where it's needed. Go are you are you teed off at, about anything from this weekend? Um, not really. I don't think. Um, nothing that comes to mind immediately. Okay, so yeah, was it just a, a it was, totally average weekend? It was fine. Well, yeah. I mean, did you watch? You probably watched Saturday Night Live for the first time. I didn't watch. I saw a clip. What are your thoughts on it? It was fine. Everything was fine. Everything's good. I like Woody Harrelson. Woody Harrelson seems like a good guy. Agreed. Have I told the story about Woody Harrelson in a Waffle House on this on this podcast? I don't think so. 
Oh, no, yeah. But that I feel like, like you have, but you it was have. a while ago. It actually might have been on part of my take like years ago. Yeah, I, it was my, I want to say my junior year, maybe senior year of college. Went down to Panama City Beach for spring break and didn't have a lot of money. Um, and there was a Waffle House that was next to our hotel. And that's really the only place that we could all afford to go eat breakfast. So we waited in line for probably an hour, hour and a half to get in this Waffle House. And we get in, start eating. And then who comes into the Waffle House but Woodrow Harrelson. Woody came in and he just sat by himself eating his lunch or, or breakfast or whatever it was, minding his own business, having a good time. And then on the way out, um, this this dad came up to Woody with his son. It was like, Woody, uh, my son's a big fan of yours. Can I take a picture with you? And Woody's like, absolutely, sure. Takes a picture. And then Woody's like, tell you what, come come outside. Come outside with me. Takes the kid and his dad outside. Woody rolled up on his motorcycle to Waffle House solo. And then he puts the kid on his motorcycle and starts wheeling him around the parking lot on the bike as his dad's like taking videos and pictures of Woody Harrelson showing his kid how to ride a bike. I just thought that was cool. It, it told me that Woody Harrelson, he was probably really, really high at the time. One, because he was Waffle House too, because he was Woody Harrelson. And so uh, he took the time out of his day as opposed to just taking a picture with his kid. Let's give this kid an experience. So that told me everything I know about Woody. I think he's a good guy. Great dude. His, fa his father, that's a crazy story. It actually is. His father was a hitman for I think the mafia and he died in prison in 2015 and was in there for a very long time. I think his his dad assassinated a federal judge. Yeah. 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 Oh my God. Yeah, wild story. So you could see that he probably I don't know there there's definitely some father issues there and he's just like wants to be a good father to kids. Does he have kids? I don't know. I did love him in True Detective. He was good in that yeah. one, too. Oh, he does have kids. Good for him. Woody Harrelson confirmed fucks. Uh, so now we're going to get into a 30-minute debate about vaccine and mask <laughs> efficacy. So Lab leak Billy. theory confirmed. <laughs> we covered would, that, that last that was, week. That was a joke, Billy. That was I know, a joke. I, I, know. I think that's the last thing people want to hear is another Amnesty. screaming Amnesty. argument about that. Now, uh, Oh, I, I missed that last week. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I heard about it. Yeah, we probably don't yeah. need to revisit yeah, well, that. Okay, we don't. Mind. Now, to, to be fair, um, the Department of Energy says that they now have low confidence that it came from a lab. So uh, it's like 50-50 split in terms of intelligence agencies that have looked it up to see if it was a lab. The basic thing is we, we still, no one really knows. We can, we can make guesses and we can try to figure out what it was, but nobody, there's no smoking gun. Nobody knows exactly what happened. Wait, I... I don't want to get into this. I yeah. do just want to correct what you said. The Department of Energy said it likely did. Yeah, with low confidence. Okay. Yeah. So when you give an intelligence report, it says you have high confidence, medium confidence, low confidence uh, in your conclusion, depending on what your confidence is. I think the WMDs in Iraq might have been medium confidence. I'm not I'm not 100% sure. Um, but they said that it likely came from the lab and they can say that with low confidence. So... There, it's like them, the FBI, they think that it came from the lab. And then there's other agencies that don't think that it came from. We don't know. That's that's the bottom line. We don't we don't know yet. I got trapped in traffic uh, driving back from D.C. to New York on Friday. And that is the worst. Like if you leave, I left at the worst time on Friday to hit every metro areas commuting traffic. Only reason I'm bringing this up is that that's where all like I pa you pass like NSA, Langley. Mm -hmm. I passed Langley before I left DC. Yeah, Langley is in saw Virginia. It. So I was just like in traffic, just seeing all these things and just being like, these are all the places where all the stuff happens. It is. All the lies come out. Then I stopped at Waffle House, I just remembered. Mm -hmm. uh, the last bastion of truth. Yeah. And I fucking love Waffle House. Can someone tell me why we don't have a Waffle House nearby? Labor have... laws. Is there a reason? You... I've said forever, if you put a Waffle House in like the East Village... Or Lower East Side somewhere on Friday and Saturday nights. I mean, it would be. I just don't think it would hit the same. Like the it Southern would. Comfort. It, it would. It, it would. It would I hit don't the same. Know. Like, it wouldn't. It, it wouldn't a hundred percent. But I mean, it'd be better than guys, not having one. Guys, there's tons of twenty-four hour diners all over New York City. But they're are, not. Are waffles. you really gonna make the argument that those I, are? I actually am. I actually am because I actually had a ton 
of food at 2 a.m. at the Orion Diner with my boys, and I had steak and eggs and a chicken parmesan at, and it was amazing. All right, I'll do it at the same as Waffle House. Yeah, it's twenty. It's twenty four hours. There's tons of twenty four hour diners, and they kind of do. I will. I love Waffle House because it's novel to me, being like being from the Northeast. Because you didn't grow up near one, right? And I bet it's great being from there, but. Those diners serve the exact same. Purpose. Here's the Was thing. there a woman named Dottie calling you sugar? And <laughs> that's that's the difference, true, right? So I, gr- I grew up in New Jersey. Diners all over, and yes, they're good. But sometimes it's hit or miss. Waffle House is good every time, and because it, it's the same food, like you just know what you're getting and every single vibe. time, and it's a vibe. That's the only reason why I don't think it would work in New York is because the Southern comfort makes the difference for me. I feel like the food will be good, but I just don't know if it'll hit the same. Overall, I think I just want a Waffle House waffle sometimes. Well, there I know they're in Pennsylvania, which if you've reached Pennsylvania, they should just be everywhere. Yeah, because at that point. So I went to one near a rest stop in Pennsylvania and it wasn't like as good. Pennsylvania is the South. Yeah, there's some in Ohio. Pennsylvania is is definitely the South. You're going to need to explain that. that Uh, that, No, if you. okay, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about Poconos. I'm not talking about Philadelphia. I mean, the Adirondacks. I'm not talking about. I mean, Scranton's kind of the South. Uh. Pittsburgh has southern elements to it, but outside of like Harrisburg, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, the major cities, they call it Pennsylvania for a reason. And I know that Kentucky is not really the South either if you go by who fought on whose side in the Civil War. But Pennsylvania, it's by the the people you meet in Pennsylvania, they are. They are the they are southern. I by couldn't that, agree more. By that logic, upstate New York is the south. Yeah, there are parts of upstate New York. Maine is the south. You're just saying Maine anywhere is not the rural. South. Maine, is, Maine is, is the south. No, you. I you could. DC is the south. No. Oh, Billy. DC, oh, I, my Billy, God, Billy, Billy, you were so wrong. No, no, DC. I was in DC for a, like, for two hours. <laughs> no, I was there since Tuesday. Okay, I've been there since 1985. And but like by that, but see, right? It's all comparative. You think Pennsylvania is the South the same way I think D.C. is the South. D.C. is one of the places I've been that reminds me the least of the South of anywhere I've ever been. Yeah. Are you, are you talking about the city of Washington? The no, District no, I'm, of Columbia? I'm, I'm are you talking, talking about, about in and around. You're talking about Virginia, Northern Virginia. Yeah. I say I often joke and say that Northern Virginia is the South just to piss people off because I know that it's a troll. No, I actually think Northern Virginia, there's a lot of Southern elements. I disagree. I you got to get... Now, if you go outside of, of the North Virginia area, like if you leave Fairfax County, Loudoun County, and you get out to Winchester, you go out towards West Virginia, I, that is the South. If you go uh, down like 81 towards Richmond, uh, well, I guess 81 would take you to Harrisonburg and, and Roanoke. But if you go down on 95 towards Richmond, then yeah, outside of Northern Virginia, Vir- Virginia is definitely the South. You know what's really the South? The eastern shore of Virginia, the little tip that dangles yeah. off the Delmarva Peninsula, that's the south. That's well, that's more southern than a lot of actually southern places. I actually think Pennsylvania is more midwestern. No, Pennsylvania's the south. No, Pennsylvania is not midwestern. Oh, then. So, what it's is vibes, your criteria? Though. Let's talk about the criteria. Yeah, vibes in D.C. Someone called me sugar in D.C. Okay, that might just be one person. Yeah. Yeah. Like, are you talking I, about African American people? No. What are you talking about? Because, like, yes, if if you're if you're somewhere and an African American lady calls you sugar, it does it feels good. <laughs> but what is your criteria for Pennsylvania being the South? And I disagree that upstate New York is the South at all, or Maine. Maine's the South. Are you kidding? Maine is like a rugged. You're just saying anywhere where people own firearms. That has some the <laughs> south. That has something to do with it. There's For also, sure. There's also like southern hospitality. Well, it could be either either or. It could be somebody who's like super hospitable to you, or it could be someone that absolutely hates people from the outside that are like the least hospitable people in the world. Those two sides are also those combined to make the south. All right. So, you guys know Cabela's, obviously. It's a great yeah. place. There's one in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. It's the biggest one in the country. And you walk in there and you feel like you're in the South. Yeah. It's a different breed. A lot I of think flannel. It's rural. Yeah. A ton a lot of flannel. flannel. Flannel's not A lot southern. of open carry weapons. Yeah. That's Southern. Yeah. yeah. Flannel is not Southern. Flannel, so- flannel is lumberjack. Well, that's that you could it say. It depends on how thick the flannel is. Yep. Yeah. If the flannel has like the fleece lining in it, that's lumberjack. lumberjack. No, no. Like Maine is flannel. Yeah. Like. That's the that's the South. No, no, I don't know. 
I'm sorry. I'm wrong. sorry, Billy. I hate to break it to you. I agree with PFT. I've been around it's a lot longer take. than you have. DC is not the South. I think DC there, is DC. I think there's more Southern people in DC than there are Northern people. Is Virginia the South? No. Parts of Virginia, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. No. What he said? Oh, no, no. With, with Bad Dog. Yeah, no. Like Southwest Virginia is the South. I'd say Central Virginia is the South, too. But I was. he said there's more Southerners in DC than Northerners. Not even close. DC is full of people who went to I mean, Harvard and, and yeah. no, I think we're Georgetown. Talking, it's too ca- it's too catchy. Like, well, there's there's liberal elite people that that live in DC. They can be there because they work for the government or they're lobbyists. But people that are like born and raised in DC, that's I, like, I don't consider them to be liberal elite. I would just say that like people, it, the uh, the type of DC that you're thinking of around the government. Those are usually people that went to school. Yeah, Ivy League. Some of them even live in New York and they just like commute down to D.C. a, a couple days commuter. a week. I'm yeah. So, you know, what I'm describing, you know, how Frank Underwood goes to the ribs place in the Netflix House of Cards. Yeah, there was a, a lot of establishments that were southern oriented. There was a lot of like of the labor force with a southern accent, white and black. Mm hmm. In D.C. And that was something that coming from New York, you don't see. DC, That's why I got that vibe. D.C. definitively not the South. I understand that you you did spend several days down there. I haven't been to D.C. really before. And I was able to be around there. And I just got like that was something I noticed that was different than the rest of the megalopolis, which is Boston to Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. which we don't talk about enough. We don't. Because I, I traveled the whole megalopolis it's just on Friday. Cool word too. Mm-hmm. Baltimore, Philadelphia, Wilmington, Wilmington. Yes, that's the city I keep forgetting that I got stuck in traffic outside of. Yeah, Wilmington. They call it Murder City. Damn. What? Apparently, Wilmington is like one of the most violent cities in the country. Low key. Definition of low key violent. That's what they say about Baltimore. Yeah, Baltimore. There's some very very bad parts of Baltimore for sure. Baltimore is high key. A high key. Yeah. I mean, when you have yeah. two successful murder TV shows based around your city. That's the Inner Harbor in Baltimore is great. I actually love it. Patterson. Yeah, that's where they used to have the, the ESPN zone. Yeah, there's Damn. a restaurant, uh, the Bygone in Baltimore. It's one of the best restaurants I've ever been to. It's on a rooftop uh, of the Four Seasons. It's like on whatever, the highest floor, and it's really sick, and the food's good. Did you guys know the history of Patterson, New Jersey? I do. Do you know why it was, how it was built? No. <laughs> So I guess I, I don't know the history that well. I just live close to there, but I know about it. Is it Patterson or Trenton? Wait. Here we go. Wait, wait. Do you Trenton. know the history of Patterson? Trenton, dude. Because I, I drove past it. I get Patterson and Trenton mixed up. Um, basically, one of those cities, they built a ton of housing in order to basically house, like if there was a nuclear disaster, to be able to put as much of the population in this city. Let me let me find it. You know what I've been getting really into recently is uh, nuclear war simulators, mm. ah. where you can choose the parameters and what type of attack you're you're involved in, and you you can put these little people all over the map and then see how those individuals fare in these cities based on where the bombs explode and if they're downwind from the fallout. It's uh it's one of the more dorky things that I do, but it's it's been interesting to say the least because you can you can actually like model what uh russia's nuclear war plans are and the united states like response to it and then see exactly who would get hit who would survive it's interesting stuff this is why if a tactical nuke gets launched in ukraine i am hightailing it out of new york city as fast as i can yeah it's probably not a bad idea i will i will work remote like i'm just saying that right now okay granted thank you but again, this is Billy pre explain why he's going to miss work. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. Uh, nuclear War Talks brought to you by Rocket Money. Did you know? <laughs> did you know? This is a fact. The average person has around 12 paid subscriptions. Think about that. Think about what you guys have on your phones right now. The things that you've signed up for, the, tree, the free trials that you have, the ones that you don't use anymore. You're just throwing money into the trash every single month on those. You might want to double check them. And with Rocket Money, you can quickly identify and cancel all of your unwanted subscriptions. I have some on my phone. I used Rocket Money to go through. Saved me 
several hundred dollars a year, maybe even more than that. There's a lot of stuff that you sign up for that you forget about where you just want to like read one article or you want to play one game and you give them your credit card, then you forget to cancel it. Well, Rocket Money is formerly known as Truebill, and they are a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spending, and it helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions that they forgot about, like that streaming service that you bought to watch just that one show on or that free trial that you never even used. Rocket Money will quickly and easily identify your subscriptions for you so you can stop paying for the ones that you don't want. Simply find the subscription that you don't want and press cancel and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash macro. That's rocketmoney.com slash macro. Rocketmoney.com slash macro. Billy, have you figured it out yet? No. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny, I looked up the history of Patterson. I, I said I did just because I, I live right around there. So I was just curious. And it's like what, you know, sometimes where it pops up where it's like people always ask. So it's like, what is Patterson, New Jersey famous for? Is Patterson a good area? Then it goes, was Sopranos filmed in Patterson? What is Gabagool? Where's the real <laughs> Sopranos house? <laughs> I like that. Wait, is it filmed there? They've, they've filmed all over. So I think they filmed a couple scenes in Patterson. Man, I just wish I could go back and be an extra in The Sopranos. Oh, How I, cool my, would that have been? My dad's buddy who he grew up with was an extra in The Sopranos. Were, like at Vesuvio's, eating at a restaurant? Yeah, no, he was walking in while Tony Soprano was walking out of somewhere. And it's, they like looked at each other. That's the dream. It's so funny. Like James Gandolfini, he, he grew up in the town next to mine. And... uh he was looked he's looked at as like this badass mob boss but in high school like he played football but he was like a loser kind of like he was like a theater kid that just like was very quiet and like didn't talk to anybody and then he just became this mega star who everyone like kind of feared almost because of his role in the show yeah he never had the makings of a varsity athlete yeah yeah uh i would love to have been an extra on the sopranos that would have been awesome oh my god best show ever i think yeah, I would say I would say so. I think The Sopranos is probably the best TV show of all time. Yeah, it never gets old. I could watch it a million times. The Wire is up there. Love The Wire. Um, Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad's up there too, for sure. I mean, first season of True Detective. Yeah, Better Call Saul. Is Better Call Saul actually good? It's really yeah, good. It's very good. Is it funny? It's got funny parts mm-hmm. in it. Yeah. Okay. I can't get into. It. I haven't. I tried getting into it. Give it another shot. Hmm. You'll like it. I feel like Billy kind of, I've only seen like TikTok things about, about Better Call Saul, but I feel like Billy has the makings of a, a Saul Goodman type. Mm. Well, what lies a lot. Wait, just the that's just being part? a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Billy should have been a lawyer. <laughs> I've never seen Breaking Bad, but I, I watch Better Call Saul because I love Bob Odenkirk, mm, okay. but I guess I got to circle back on Breaking Bad. You should also go back and watch Mr. Show with Bob and David. That was their sketch comedy show that they did in the 90s. Bob Odenkirk and who? One of the funniest things ever. Bob Odenkirk and David Cross. Oh, So really? from Arrested Development. I love David Cross. Yeah, Tobias, mm-hmm. that was his name on, on Arrested Development. Yeah, they had they had some all-time sketches on there. Uh, one of my favorite shows of all time. Check it out if you haven't seen it already. And on nano dosing, this way, excuse me, on extra dosing, uh, Billy and Mad Dog are going to get into... The Last of Us. Yes. Yeah. Which I'm I'm excited to listen to you guys talk about because I have I started watching The Last of Us yesterday. Oh, so watched three episodes. Episode three just destroyed me. That's one of the best episodes mm. in TV history, I think. That episode, that extra dosing episode, heavy spoiler alert. We're just gonna yeah. talk about everything. <laughs> like, don't listen to it if you haven't seen all the episodes. That's why we're not letting PFT join the podcast for that. Mm-hmm. Because he hasn't seen all of them, and we we don't want to rob him of those experiences. I am fascinated with the premise behind the show, which is what if a fungus was able to infect human beings the way that it infects ants? Mm-hmm. And you know, you see, I saw this one video on Twitter the other week where it was, uh, I think it was horse worms or hair worms that had infected a praying mantis, mm-hmm. and they put it in water, and then all these worms just like. Yeah squirted out of the mantis to get into the water i saw that because they're parasites and they take over the mantis's body and they fuck with its brain 
and they make the mantis want to go towards water which is where those worms reproduce hmm. and the whole parasite relationship and i guess fungus is similar to that yeah. mm -hmm. the cordyceps where they'll take over an ant's body and then make the ant want to get up to high ground above its colony so that it can just break through the ant's skin and then drop spores all over the colony yeah. mm -hmm. it's it's fat it's actually like the creepiest thing in the world it's oh. so scary because it's it, like the whole premise this isn't a spoiler it's like if if climate change continues, like this could be something that like could happen in humans or something. Yeah. The Everything about this show is what's, fascinating. What's crazy is Jake Plummer gave us cordyceps. Yep. To take. Seriously? Yeah, because it's supposed to enhance athletic performance and like give you more energy. Well, I actually took lion's mane before this. Because it doesn't, cordyceps doesn't affect your brain. It affects your nervous system. So. Isn't that part of, your brain's part of the nervous system? But it doesn't like, it doesn't attack only your brain. Mm-hmm. So. In the show, when they're doing what they're doing, their their brain is fully aware that they're doing this and they're trying to, their body and their brain are like working against each other basically. So the human is still in there. Got it. Wait, we don't know that. I, I've watched a lot of analysis videos, Billy. Like, Wait, that's I, a spoiler. That hasn't been revealed on the show yet. Bleep that out. <laughs> that's from the video game. No. It, Do you, it was a video game. Like, I know it was that's a That's a spoiler. Game. So like don't... Come on, we don't want to rob people. No, that's not really a spoiler. That's it's like speculation. How, it's how the mm. fungus works. Well, we were also talking about toxoplasmosis. Yeah. That was when I had my little end of Monday episodes way back in the pandemic when I just like go on deep dives. Mm -hmm. We talked about toxoplasmosis and that's a really cool one. It's a, it's a parasite in cat's poop that is subsequently eaten by rats causing the rats to have no uh, fear of predators and just walk towards cats willy-nilly, not caring, and then get eaten by the cats, which then have the parasite reproduce in their intestines, and then they poop it out, and then the rats get it in some sort of food. And it's like, it in about, I think like 70% of motorcycle crash victims who like are doing risk are in like really bad accidents they test positive for toxoplasmosis because humans can pick it up how do humans pick it up uh people who own cats uh Ew, so it's yeah. like you're eating cat poop like by accident Ew. but like you end up eating like a lot of stuff yes if you're around cats and like you know cats are climbing up on the table and just like a little gets in your food i don't know like it's so, like crazy cat lady has toxoplasmosis and that's why she doesn't care about the law you know property rights <laughs> like she's, she's squatting on her eviction notice yeah so she's like i don't care <laughs> there was a study that was done i think it was in 2022 or 2021 where they looked at how toxoplasmosis affected people's uh like risk-taking behaviors as well as their political beliefs and uh they were saying that for men toxoplasmosis uh Let's see, it says, among men only, toxoplasmosis status was no longer associated with tribalism. Uh, but they say that uh, toxoplasmosis was associated with lower cultural liberalism and lower anti-authoritarianism. So if you have toxoplasmosis, then I think you're more likely to be, or you're less likely to be liberal if you have toxoplasmosis. So one time I found these barn kittens. <laughs> and I oh, was yeah. raising them and uh, I got really, really more right wing after that. <laughs> it was also the pandemic. There may have been, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Wait, yeah, do you think you have toxoplasmosis? Uh, my mom does because uh, she had to take a test for it during pregnancy uh, and maybe because I've been around, like there, there was barn cats in a barn where I used to like play a lot as a child. So like those are the types of cats that would have toxic toxoplasmosis. If there's if there's a, a disease or a parasite that is uh, more heavily found and contracted by people who spend lots of time in barns, Billy's definitely a uh, high risk. There was actually there was a bat colony in a barn I was making residence of, and why do you have to be so weird about everything? What? Be like I lived in a barn. Yeah, I, <laughs> and there were bats. I got sent home from college and. I didn't want to live with my parents. So I was like, 
I'm going to make this bar in my spot. You do, you sound like a cop talking about, like writing up an official report where it's like there was a barn. And at that time, numerous individuals, including myself, had established residential type behaviors <laughs> inside the structure. <laughs> Just say you lived in a barn. I lived in a barn and there's bats. <laughs> and uh, I still think that like what, there's this like crazy story of like people getting bitten by bats uh, and they have no idea they got bitten by the bat. And then like six months later they just drop dead of rabies because like a rabid bat bites them i'm terrified of rabies yeah rabies and then i found it i thought it was six months so i'd moved out and i'd been out of the barn for six months i was like okay so if i got bit by a bat it would have you know i would have died i was like phew pass that one on then i was scrolling reddit and it was like did you know rabies can kill you seven years later after the bite and i was like fuck <laughs> i don't know if that's necessarily true there's been I feel, like, I feel like rabies progresses a little bit more quickly than that. No, because it, it's a sleeper cell. Really? Yeah. So seven years, if I die of rabies, I think I'm two years removed from the barn. So we'll see. All right. We got to get a clock going on that. <laughs> uh, anything else you want to get into or we want to jump into this interview with Scott Rogowski from HQ Trivia? Let's go to Scott. Let's yeah. go to Scott. Let's wanna, go to Scott. Do you want to tell people what our episode is for this week yes so we can yes i do um this week we're going to be talking about the murdoch murders yeah <gasps> uh, you can see the documentary on netflix it's a three-part series it just gets crazier and crazier so if you make it through episode one and you're like this is kind of weird but not that wild just stay tuned because it gets a lot deeper a lot heavier i've been paying attention to these guys for the last I think they started to make national news back in 2021. That's when the murder happened. Yeah. yeah and, and reading into all the stuff that has gone on with this family in South Carolina, it's, uh, it's fascinating. So we will be talking about the Murdaws on Thursday's episode. So watch that. And then I think the week after that, we're going to be doing um, an episode on Malaysian Air. Which a lot is, of people have been asking for that. So yeah, I'm there's, excited to get into that. There's a documentary coming out on Netflix, not this Thursday, but I think the following Thursday, the day that, that episode the episode is going to drop, yep. which will be cool. So people will be able to watch that as well. Um, but the Malaysian airline that uh, disappeared, it just it just went missing and they haven't been able to find it. Uh, and they've spent, I think, hundreds of millions of dollars trying to track this plane down, figure out what happened to it, how it crashed, where it went, maybe if it got sucked into a wormhole maybe if it landed in russia somewhere or maybe if the pilot was responsible for everything and just crashed in a location that we haven't been able to find yet so um some fascinating stuff coming up in the next couple weeks mm -hmm. stay tuned to that scott rogowski is going to be brought to you by sport clips consider this not every hairstyle is created equal many stylists don't have much experience cutting men's hair but you don't know until it's too late at Sport Clips, all stylists undergo specialized training, specifically in how to cut and style men's hair, making them not just stylists, but scissor-cutting scholars, virtuosos of volume, and fade fanatics. After all, it's not just any average haircut. This is the big league that we're talking about. These are haircutting professionals, so don't hand your bushy old noggin over to just anyone with a pair of clippers. Sport Clips takes cutting men's hair to another level, which is why they truly are the pros in men's hair. Don't forget the MVP experience, the hot steam towel afterwards. Best way to finish up a haircut on planet Earth. Check out Sport Clips. Go to Sport Clips right now. If you're looking to get a haircut, you should go to Sport Clips. And now, here's Scott Rogowski. Okay, we welcome on a very special guest, Scott Rogowski. Did I pronounce your last name right? You got it. Scott you Rogowski. It. Um, Quiz Daddy. You remember him from HQ Trivia. He's on here. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, what happened with HQ, where what he's been up to since and also uh, promoting the documentary Glitch that's coming out on CNN. Glitch, the rise and fall of HQ Trivia, premiering Sunday, March 5th at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. I'll give the West Coast a little bit of love, first of all, on that. So 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific on CNN. Check it out, Glitch, the rise and fall of HQ Trivia. Um, it's, it's cool to have you on the show. I think everybody here in this room, uh, we were all HQties. Is that what we call it ourselves? H cuties, H cucumbers, H unicorns. I was trying to come up with that. That was one of the many exercises I had. The fun parts of the of the job for me was I wanted to create a unifying term for the fans of the show, right? And yeah. it was a completely organic trial 
an error situation where I was throwing out different different terms. But then HQDs came to me in a fever dream, and uh, that one stuck. HQD patooties, if you want to be, if you're not into the whole brevity thing. <laughs> well, what about for Billy? You could be HQ and on. Yeah. HQ and on. That wasn't around back then. That was, that was not pre- exactly. That would have been. Yeah. The the. <laughs> The right wing leaning fans would be the HQ and ons, um, <laughs> but they that did not exist as an entity back then, so I couldn't pun on it. Uh, H, Qu- I thought about calling them Quizlings, my little Quizlings. Okay. But if you're familiar with history, Quizling was a uh, Nazi collab- collaborator with the Norwegians. I believe he was the, pr- oh, <laughs> the yeah. prime minister of Norway. So I don't know if Quizling was a good with an S good term. They might have, yeah, they might yeah. have frowned on that. That might not have been. Yeah, good for, for I think a- I threw it out there at one point. But another thing, you know, do you guys know what HQ stands for? I well, I was going to say headquarters, but that's obviously not correct. Headquarters is not correct. It's actually Hebrew quarterback. Uh, it was, it's named after Jay Fiedler. Uh, okay. HQ. So that that was that's something you guys didn't know either. Yeah, very, <laughs> I'm, lear- I'm learning something new already. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I I do feel like uh, you've been you've been a part of our lives for a little bit. Like, it, is that kind of weird knowing that so for so many people for for that uh, period of time, you were like a constant presence in their life. You would just pop up on their phones and they felt like they knew you. It's super weird. Everything about the whole hosting HQ was weird for me. Very surreal. Um, yeah. Having that parasocial relationship, which was a term that I didn't even no, at the time, I've since come to learn, uh, you know, with so many strangers, you know, strangers to me, but people who, you know, I was in their, not only like in their homes, but in their hands. And it's it's one thing to be on someone's TV, to be in your hand, to be on that screen that you're spending upwards of eight, 10 hours a day on, um, according to your, your weekly reports. Uh, it, it is it is something else, I guess, something that that really bonds you to to the person. And um, I mean, look, this is a perfect example. The fact that we're talking, you were, you were uh, fans of the show and, and I know Aaron w- was playing and I, I, I got so many athletes and musicians reaching out to me. It got to the point where like I'm DMing with like Russell Okung <laughs> and, and Lance Armstrong and like the lead singer of Evanescence, like all these the most disparate groups of people. Yeah are all like, hey, Scott, we love what you're doing. Hey, man, like, you know, inviting me to things. And it's just like, what what's happening here? I mean, I, you know, to to have I, I this is this this kind of this is a little snapshot you'll appreciate. This kind of sums up how bizarre it got for me, my life in 2018. There was a moment, a night in 20 summer of 2018, where I'm in Austin, Texas, being driven to a local bar. Who's in the front seat of this truck? Houston Street, former rookie of the year, two time all star pitcher A's Houston Street passenger seat Drew Stubbs another former big leaguer Reds Indians both Texas boys teammates next to me in the back seat Lance Armstrong and the three of us just driving to a bar in Austin and it's just like what one of these people does not belong maybe two of us don't belong here (laughs) well what the hell was I doing there okay I mean it was like you know I, I grew up watching these guys play ball watching Lance and now I'm I'm in the car with him Possibly, you know, on, on my way to a reckless evening, I was like definitely only one wearing a seatbelt that night. You better mm-hmm. believe that. Um, the neurotic Jew in me was trying to, you know, stay alive in that moment. Yeah, that's it, it's, it's very cool. I think you were, I don't want to say like universally loved. I think most people liked you a lot. I would get annoyed at you when I would lose. And then all of a sudden the, the funny little quips and jokes, they get a lot less funny at that point. Yeah. I'm like, this piece of shit's laughing at me, you know? But yeah, uh, yeah. But I think for the most part, like, what what would you say, like 85, 90% of people? You had a pretty good Q score, right? I did hire a team to calculate the exact numbers here to get uh, to see the haters versus lovers. No, I don't know. I can't put a percentage on I I did get a lot of favorable tweets. And so uh, all I can say is most people enjoyed. There were definitely people, oh, you talk too much. Hey, shut up, get to the questions. But it's like most of the time it's because I was being told there's a guy behind the camera going, keep talking we're having issues <laughs> the thing is breaking we, you know there's either too many people trying to play and the app wasn't working or you know they something was going wrong behind the scenes so if, if i was talking too much that was why because I, we, we could we physically could not start the game yet you were good at it too you were good at filling that time it it, it off it never felt or for the most part unless the game was like glitching which did happen we can get into that in a little bit yeah. but for the most part it felt like you were just you were you know having a natural conversation and you were filling the time Really well. So maybe let's go back to the start here and, and you can tell us how you got involved in HQ Trivia and how they selected you. And they're like, this guy 
is the Alex Trebek for the short attention span internet generation. Right. Um, I was basically a struggling, semi-struggling, underemployed comedian talk show host. I've been hosting a show called Running Late with Scott Rogowski, Running Late Show for, at that point, six years or so. And I had been doing a show called, you'll appreciate this, before that, in 2008 to 2011, I had a show with my buddy Neil called 12 Angry Mascots, which was a sports comedy show, which we were doing in New York and had people like, you know, Kenny Mayne and Darrell Revis and uh, David Deal from the Giants and Chris huh. Duhon as, as, as guests. We would have athlete guests and sports personality guests and we do comedy around sports and do sketches and things. So it was a sports comedy talk show for three years. I've been doing stand up all that time. The sports comedy thing sort of fizzled out right, right around where Norm McDonald had his sports show on Comedy Central 2011. Yeah, we were taking meetings with Comedy Central. Comedy Central had the sports show with Norm McDonald and they had the Onion Sports Dome. They had two sports comedy shows on at the same time. It was like the peak of sports comedy on TV. And we were getting a meeting with Comedy Central and then they're like, yeah, guys, these shows aren't doing too well. So we're, <laughs> we're putting the kibosh on the whole sports vertical. Um, so we kind of saw the writing on the wall at that point and ended our show. Amani Toomer was our final guest. That was a great show. Shout out Amani. And then uh, I, I did my own show, Running Late, from 2011 to 2019. But So I was doing that and, and really wanted to move to L.A. with the show. I, I'd done what I could in New York. I reached sort of a ceiling there, got write-ups in New York Magazine and New York Times and New Yorker and all the New York stuff. I said, I want to go to L.A. and try to become more of a national uh, entity. And before I had a chance to move, I got a call from a friend, Nick, who worked at The Onion. I used to work at The Onion back in 20, 2008. I interned there. That was my first job. It was unpaid, but my first kind of thing out of college. So I stayed in touch. You know, the thing about internships, all those, all those young kids listening out there, if you got an internship, maybe you're not getting paid, but the relationships matter and they will pay off. So be nice, be good at what you're doing, get to know people in the office or on the Zooms or wherever virtual environment you have these days because you make those connections in your internship, maybe they'll pay off down the line. And in this case, you know, nine years after that internship, this guy, Nick, called me up. I and mean, we, we had been in touch. We'd been Facebook friends. We'd hung out. It wasn't like totally out of the blue. But I, you know, I wasn't talking to this guy all the time. Get a call from Nick randomly, hey, I'm casting for this thing called HQ. Actually, it wasn't even called it. They didn't have a name for it at the time. I'm casting for this game show on a phone, yada, yada. I, I was like, what the, f you know, game show on the phone? I mean, it, I could not have thought lower of this at the time. I'm like, great, maybe I'll book this gig. And then my next job will be gas station TV. You know, I'll be, I'll be, hey, while you're filling up, oh, yeah. there's a special on, yeah, while you're on pump two, there's a special on Kit Kats inside, you know, but, uh, but I got this, I got it. I, I went to the audition. I auditioned amongst 20 other people or so. And they just chose me. I could the key to the audition was I did not care about booking this thing. I was already out the door. I was going to move to LA in a couple of months. I moved out of my apartment in Brooklyn at that point already. So this is my one last swan song, my last audition. I never booked anything. All those auditions I did for uh search party, for uh uh, uh what was the show? Uh geez, um Alana Glazer and Abby Jacobson. How Broad City? Okay. I auditioned for Broad City a few times. I auditioned for all these little things. Never booked anything. And then this one audition. Oh, commercials for Delta or whatever. Noah Syndergaard, some commercial to him. Didn't book any of that. But this this HQ audition, I got it because I just really didn't care about it at all. I went in there. I looked like shit. I had you know uh, completely overgrown beard, moth-eaten sweater, wearing my glasses, which I never never normally did when I did auditions. And I got it. So go figure. There's a lesson um, there, right? I, I, I actually do think that sometimes when you don't care, or at least if you can convince yourself not to care in that moment, then it kind of opens you up a little bit and you take some risks in the audition that you probably wouldn't take to begin with. And people like I the agree. fact like this guy really doesn't want to work for us. I have to have him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's definitely something there, man. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, Bill, you got any questions for him right off the bat? Yeah. You know, nowadays there's TikTok and HQs trying to do like a revamp in itself. What do you think, have you consumed any of their like trivia products and what do you think they're missing that, you know, the original HQ had? There was a lot of magic in that time in 2018 onward that just was encapsulated, but they can't seem to catch it again. What do you think it may be? And do you think that uh, moving forward, this sort of medium, especially live quiz, 
uh, content is going to continue to be as successful as it once was or it just needs time now? I think what's missing, frankly, is the monopoly on the format. I mean, when HQ launched five, six, five and a half years ago now, there it was the only live streaming show in a sense like you, you know what i mean like you know instagram live i guess was around at that point periscope things like that of nature but they weren't being utilized harnessed in this way of like treating it like a production and this is a show with the point money and you can play this you can interact the interactivity is key i mean everything else is just chat right chat maybe you drop an emoji you drop a heart but this was the first show of its kind where the very beginning i think people were tuning in for the technology they're like wait a minute I can play this. There's a live host. I can open my phone at a certain time. I can start tapping buttons here, answer questions, and win money. Like this, this is a real. This is real. This is happening. Five and a half years later, we all are familiar with that concept. We all know what's possible, and there are so many imitators and so much competition. And even TikTok, I saw the other TikTok started doing this trivia thing. I was like, every time you open TikTok for the last few weeks, you get that join TikTok rewards register, right? I mean, you also. I think there's, they're going to have 10 million people playing this thing the way they're promoting this. Everybody on TikTok is going to be playing. Well, I tuned in. And I think they have like a half a million. So even with all that promotion, even being TikTok itself, which has sucked up everyone's attention, they couldn't get the HQ numbers. Huh. And I think it's just because there's so much more stuff out there now demanding our attention, taking us away. So the question of can any thing recapture that magic and get the millions and millions and millions of concurrence the way hq did ah, you know may, maybe maybe not for trivia because it also it's like guys trivia has been done we did it i did mm -hmm. hq trivia for years like you know there are other formats to explore here and that's the, that's the real shame of you know it's called the rise and fall of hq the rise could have included all these other games it fell because it didn't go beyond trivia it didn't mm -hmm. it didn't expand beyond just the format. They had a words thing that came out a little too little too late. But we should have had 10 different options, 10 different formats going after two years. And we could have become a network and really could have become this billion dollar behemoth that we should have been. But because we didn't innovate and iterate on the product side, that's where it fell apart. So I'm hoping there is, uh, you know, without disclosing too much, I am working with some some people who have some ideas on, on how to get back to those rare stratospheric uh, airs of of the HQ level audiences, but it might not be trivia. Let's put it that way. So that was going to be my follow up question. Do you see yourself doing a similar type product, maybe on a different platform? I mean, we see a lot of Vine stars today thriving on TikTok and other mediums and celebrity boxing. You know, yeah, you considered fighting Jake Paul. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I'd, I'd sooner hang out with the Murdochs than, uh, <laughs> than, than, than get in a ring with Jake Paul. But um, no, I think there's. Uh, you know, again, it, it's about coming up with the right format, um, the right talent. And, you know, there there also is something I don't know if I want to give away all the secrets here, but it's maybe it's maybe it's not a secret. It's so glaringly obvious. Think about what HQ was. HQ was an app that existed purely for 15 minutes of your time each day, maybe 30, maybe we did two, two yeah. shows a day, so 30 minutes a day. That's literally the only use you had for this app. You open it at three o'clock in the afternoon, nine o'clock at night. It, and, it, and that's part of what drove usage, I think, of the app and downloading the app. And maybe, you know, there was people on the team arguing, well, we got to have things going on throughout the day, mini games, pe keep people engaged. But you know what? There's so much going on in your life, whether you're listening to podcasts, you're watching TikToks, you're watching YouTube, you're this, that. It's kind of nice to have this little you know, a corner of your phone where you know it's dedicated to just this one thing. Facebook tried an HQ imitator and it did not work because it was in the Facebook app. This TikTok trivia thing, it was, you know, 500,000, a million people. I think they got to a million, I heard. I, I don't know what the final game numbers were. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see, but, you know, they did decently well, but they're also in the TikTok app. There's a lot going on in the TikTok app. I think having a dedicated app is also part of what made HQ work. Yeah, did you ever read the chat as it was going on? Or would you go back and read the chat later? Oh man, you know, in the beginning, in the beginning days, it was it was going, moving slow enough where I could actually read the chat and respond to it. And then it got to a point where it was a blur. It was literally a blur of text going up because so many people were chatting. 
and it was hard to keep up. But yeah, no, I, I, you know, again, one of those early days, I would, I would read the chat, hear what's going on. Something just got out of control. Something I sort of realized about the app, and I think part of the magic was for my generation. Uh, like I was in college when we were watching it. It was one of the first times you had a whole group of people and everyone around you all tuning in for something at the same time. And then yeah. because it was live, being able to discuss it. Whereas like TV shows for us, like we didn't have like the the Sunday night. We're bingers. We're going on these streaming services. So it was right. the one time where we were all like all watching the same thing at the same time besides sports, but, and then all participating and then talking about it afterwards. So it was just, it was a pretty magical time, honestly, in the- Nothing beats things. live, man. You're talking yeah. about this and it reminds me of my dad telling me, you know, when he was in college in the seventies, his frat bros, his dorm mates getting together to watch Saturday Night Live when it came out. Mm -hmm. Like that was the same kind of thing. We all got together, they watched Saturday Night Live because it was live on Saturday night. And just like you're saying, you kind of crowd around, you're watching things, you're joking with each other. So to have that live tune in aspect, I agree. I mean, I, for me, I was in college when I remember this very clearly. MTV had this show called Human Giant. With, it was like Ziz Ansari's first show and Rob Hubel, Paul Shear. They had like a 24-hour takeover of MTV. And for 24 hours, they stayed up. They brought all their friends in from the comedy scene in New York, all these UCB people. And it was live. And I like wanted to watch it live and stay up with these guys and, and watch you know, all my favorite comedians doing but Nick Kroll and Mulaney and they were doing Oh Hello back then. And they were all, I mean, it was hysterical. And because it was live, I was tuning in. And you're absolutely right, uh, Billy Football. Yeah. It, it was it was because of, of that, that you couldn't DVR, you couldn't binge it later. You had to be in it to win it and you got to be live with it. How much would have it popped off if you guys had started HQ Trivia during COVID? That's that's when we really needed some time I to like come and together the, and watch anything the, live. You know, <laughs> the great irony is that it uh, went bust on uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day, 2020. So it actually <laughs> it was just a few weeks yeah. before COVID lockdown. The whole thing went bankrupt. Yeah, that's our, just one of the cruel, cruel ironies of life. Our options would have been rewatch Tiger King or HQ trivia again at that point. That's like all yeah, the you, entertainment that we had at that point. The HQ, the HQ fiends were just watching old clips on YouTube of HQ from October 2017 just to get their fix. What was the uh, what was the hardest question you ever asked? I recently re-asked it for the CNN social page here, so I, it's fresh in my mind. Let's see. I think it was um, for a period of time. Um, the main source of U.S. electricity came from, you know, what what source? You know, where where was what, what was? I forget the exact wording, but basically it was like, where did the U.S. get most of its electricity from at a certain point in time? And it was like New York wastewater. Um, God, the blanking on the third yeah. one, or 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 Soviet warheads, and the answer was Soviet warheads. Like some kind of Whoa. decommissioned warhead thing was powering our, the radiation was powering our, our energy grid. I don't know the specifics, but apparently 99% of the people got it wrong. It was that difficult of a question. Um, That's so I, I kind of butchered it in the retelling there, but it, that was, that. and then bird's nest soup is definitely one of the more famous ones. That one I remember verbatim. It was uh, the Asian delicacy bird's nest soup is primarily composed of what ingredient? Shredded noodles. Or cabbage, shredded cabbage, noodles, or bird's nests? And the answer was bird's nests. <laughs> it's called bird's nest soup. It's made from the actual nest that these swallows in Japan, they use their spit to create these nests under roofs of houses or something or in caves. Whoa. And people harvest these nests and melt it down into the soup and they drink it and eat it. Well, you've given Billy something to look into about the Russian nuclear warhead. I'm sure that he'll have a full, yeah, a full round up of that on, on win or Thursday's show. Yeah. Uh, Big T, you have some questions for him? Yeah, so obviously uh, we've discussed HQ. That's what 99% of people know you from, but I was curious you know, to see what you've done since then. And I came across uh, Quiz Daddy's Closet, which is a yeah. uh, retro clothing store that you own. And I know you're a big, right. a big sports fan in the pictures I've seen. There's a lot of sports jerseys in there. I'm curious, do you have some favorite uh, oh, wow. memorabilia jerseys that have come through there? Well, I'm holding. I don't know if this is there could be a video oh, component to nice. this. But oh, yeah. 1980, yeah. 1983 Orioles uh, World Series champions hat right here. Yeah, I've, I'm wearing a Montreal Alouettes shirt. Oh, nice. CFL. 
Hell yeah. 97. Shout out the Alouettes. In fact, I've got right next to me here. This is part of the personal collection, the PC. So you're not going to find this at Quiz Daddy's, which you can find at 2525 Main Street in Santa Monica or quizdaddies.com. But this stays with me. I have a collection of these great Negro League shirts from the early 90s produced by a company uh, called Underground Railroad. I just love the Negro League history. And I love the design of these shirts. New York Black Yankees. I've got Detroit Stars, Pittsburgh Crawfords. I mean, if you've never dug into the Negro Leagues, go to the museum in Kansas City. It's one of the best museums I've ever been to. And these guys were the best athletes of their time, and they did not get to play in the major leagues. It's so insane to me that this was a chapter in our history. I mean, there's so much of, the, of that history that's terrible. But the fact that these guys didn't get to compete with the Babe Ruths and the DiMaggio's um, of the time, Ted Williams, I mean, it, it, it is it is kind of uh, – it is just kind of one of those scars on our history, like so much of it. But I, I love the Negro League stuff, so I've got that personal collection. But there's so much, there's so much stuff you can get at the closet. Come on down, visit me. I'm there Thursday through Sunday. But yeah, it's been uh, I've, I've been busy with that. I've been busy with a lot of things. I, I done a little acting. I recently just wrapped production on the all Jewish reboot of Ghostbusters. So that's uh, that's I, I voice the character of Slimerwitz. So that's coming out soon. <laughs> Very cool, and um, I'm staying busy with my ostrich farm, guys. I've got you got ostriches. Yeah, I've, I've just signed a deal with uh, Sea World. We, we're providing ostrich legs for the concession stands there. So this is there's a lot going on in my life. It's it's I, uh, you're gonna have to be very literal with Billy because <laughs> Billy sometimes. <laughs> I mean, wait, wait, ostrich farms aren't that out there. Yeah. There's, it, I mean, it, in California, if you, if you live in Los Angeles, I assume that there's probably not. That's probably. not ground zero for ostrich farming. <laughs> I. I I, I do love these, like, you know, because I do. There's a part of me that feels like a former athlete or like a someone who's sort of in semi retirement where it's like, what's that guy doing now? And like some of these guys, you know, buy ranches or they're just out there, you know, cutting weeds or whatever they're doing, bushwhacking. But uh, yeah, I kind of like the idea of just moving to moving to the middle of Wyoming or Montana and getting an ostrich farm. So. No, I'm not doing that currently, but maybe maybe in my near future. Yeah, I think I mean, Schwar- you're you're invited. Schwarzenegger has like a, a a bunch of alpacas. I think he's got yeah. alpacas yeah. just running through his house willy nilly. Nicer than llamas. Very nicer than llamas. They don't spit nearly as much. A little follow up to uh, Quiz Daddy's closet. I saw that you got a lot of Alex Trebek's clothing from his estate sale. And well, I did. I did have a lot. I sold it all off. We I did a fundraiser for the Lust Garden Foundation for pancreatic cancer research. So. What I did was I went to the estate sale and I'm kind of, you know, look, the, the Alex Trebek estate can do what they want with their money. I'm pretty sure Alex Trebek made a fair amount of it during his lifetime. They made a lot more of it at their estate sale because they were not cheap at this place. <laughs> but uh, I, I spent a, a couple couple racks at Alex Trebek's estate sale and then sold it uh, uh, and raised raised two grand for uh for the Les Garden Foundation. So I kept a few things for myself, but no, he had he had this Trebek, you know, hockey jerseys with his name on the back that he was gifted from these teams. He had some really cool stuff in there, man. And it was a thrill just to be rifling through his actual closet, pulling out T-shirts from the 70s and 80s. One says world sexiest game show host. I kept that one for myself. <laughs> now, um, we I don't think it's been seen much of your side of the story in this, but everyone at least all my friends were thinking that you would definitely be the de facto choice for the next Jeopardy host. Yeah. What is there any story? I am. That? I'm hosting Jeopardy. You haven't been watching it. I know. I host. I host Jeopardy every night. <laughs> I haven't watched watch Jeopardy it? in a long time. Yeah, there you go, dude. True. Wait, <laughs> oh, wait, Billy. Billy picked up on that one. Okay. Yeah. So Billy, <laughs> yeah. Billy understands fiction. Fiction. That's but fiction, we but, we were all just uh, totally wanting you there, and we were just like, "Yeah, did you get a call? Yeah. Did you did you think about I, auditioning for it?" I here's what happened. Here's what happened. Typical showbiz. So yes, I would have liked to have been in the running for it. Not I'm not saying I deserved it or anything. I just it would have been nice to have been in the mix, especially when they were doing all those celebrity, you know, guest hosts. Right? They had Aaron Rodgers and Anderson Cooper and and Doctor Oz for crying out loud. I'm like, if Dr. Oz can get a guest hosting spot here, they should at least maybe offer to someone who has true game show hosting experience. Alas, I, I did get a meeting after, you know, you know, talking to my agents and my manager for, for a couple of years there, trying to like set the foundation for this because we knew he was retiring. He was announcing it, you know, then he announced he, he got sick. So we knew there was going to be a time when he'd no longer be hosting and 
um, trying to trying to set the foundation. Well, I, I did finally get a meeting with someone who knew the producer, a friend of the like someone who was not working at Sony or working with the team per se, but someone who had the producer's ear. And that was like going to be the first step, maybe. So I had a meeting with him and he's like, oh, this is great. You know, you'd be perfect for this. But um, we're all booked up on the guest spots right now. So uh, sorry. <laughs> that that's was a, that's that's that a mistake. Was, they they blew that. that one. Yeah, that's. And, but then but then we find out it was all rigged, right? Because that guy, Mike Richards, the guy who was in charge of looking for the new host, put himself in the position. If you recall, yeah. this was the yeah. big controversy. So, you know what? None of that would, would have mattered anyway. It wasn't wasn't my job to have Mike. Mike had the inside track the whole time, but it still would have been nice to have even a sham trial, even <laughs> to have just a, a, a one week chance to, to show what I can do would have been nice. But you know what? That was it is what it is. Say that, it, it was such a funny search for the next host because he was the executive producer and it was his call. <laughs> it's like when uh, when when they asked Dick Cheney to find who George W. Bush's running mate should be. And then he went out and interviewed a bunch of people. It's, uh, it's, it's got to be me, George. Yeah, you don't need me. I guess it's me. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, we'll let you go in a second. I do have I, I got one last question for you because Billy and I were talking before you came on about how, uh, you know, the origins of HQ uh, through the founders were tied through Vine and how yes. a problem that the, the creators of Vine had was that the the creators were getting bigger than the platform itself, or at least right. that's what they thought. Did you ever experience that at HQ where it was like at, at some point it was like, oh, it's the Quiz Daddy show. We're tuning in because Scott lives in my phone and he tells me to do trivia twice a day. Did you did the people that you work with? Was there ever any animosity where they felt this guy is becoming too much of the star of the show as opposed to the product? Well, I think in the documentary, have you had a chance to watch the documentary, by the way? I have not had a chance to watch okay. it. Yet. I so will. If you when you watch it, you'll there. There is I mean, there's a famous story, the sweet green incident, which is re retold in the doc. Um, yeah, I, it, you know, I, it's some, not something that that I can absolutely prove unless you get you get the guy, my boss, in a in a, in a lie lime detector and kind of press him on this stuff. But to and to my mind, my perspective, there was the sense from this guy Russ in particular, who was mm -hmm. one of the co-founders of HQ and became CEO of HQ, and he was on the founding team of Vine, that he had been burned by Vine, right? Because he created this thing that just completely got away from him. All these creators, the Paul brothers, all these people got so huge on there and then took their audiences elsewhere and monetized and became rich and famous. And they sold their company to Twitter, which then promptly shut it down. So he kind of lost the company. He didn't, he got rich. <laughs> he definitely made some millions on that thing, but he didn't get famous. And I think he really wanted that next level of, you know, I mean, I know for a fact that 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 Russ is the guy who uh, you know idolized the Zuckerbergs and Elon Musk's of the world. I mean, he 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 wants to be that celebrity entrepreneur. So I do know that that is in the back of his mind that he wants that celebrity element of entrepreneurship and being a tech executive who's well known to the world. Um, he wasn't getting that with the Vine experience, and I think there was a bit of professional jealousy seeping in once HQ started to get big. I mean, I can tell you that for the first, you know, few months of hosting HQ, he told me very clearly, uh, uh, you know, any request that comes in for media, let's say a podcast like yours want to interview me, could not do it. I had to forward the request to him. He was our PR team and he would shut it down. I got emails from GQ magazine. Hey, we want to do a story on you, do a little photo essay. I forwarded to Russ, never heard from GQ again. You know, all, I had a gag order essentially on all media and that. You have to wonder, well, if you're the executive of a company CEO, wouldn't you want to get press for your host, for your show? Wouldn't that be something that you would actively seek out, maybe even hire a PR team, spend five grand a month to get that kind of press from GQ and media outlets? Yeah, that's a normal company would probably operate that way. This guy wanted to control the narrative, keep everything to himself. And if you look back at all the early articles of HQ, it's all about Russ and Colin and Vine founders and Russ. And my name is not mentioned in any of those articles. Mm -hmm. uh, but finally, there was a breaking point when someone from the Daily Beast wanted to do a profile on me. And that's I'll leave the cliffhanger there for to watch the documentary, because that's when the S hit the fan. I mean, I'd be pretty pissed, too, if TikTok just stole my concept and became absolutely gigantic. I mean, think about it. 
yeah missed the boat on that one <laughs> yeah uh well but 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 it got, it got to the point where too like just a little thing like you know chiron's on the screen you know he wouldn't let me put at scott rogowski how he wouldn't let me shout out my social media channels yeah uh, follow me on twitter i couldn't say follow me on twitter follow me on instagram it was all about hq hq follow hq you know it, it, it yeah. got yeah it was like well, you know he, he was very clearly uh trying to hold on to this thing and not not let it get out of his control but lo and behold best laid plans all right. Well, I, I can't wait to watch the documentary. It's coming out on CNN on Sunday. If you're listening to me right now, it's Sunday, March 5th, and it's going to premiere at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. And then it'll replay three hours later. Glitch, the rise and fall of HQ Trivia. Scott, thank you for joining us. Quiz Daddy, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Absolute and, uh, pleasure. Best of luck. I, I hope I hope that your face will be popping up on my phone again in the future. I, I I believe it will. In the meantime, I'll be in Joshua Tree macrodosing myself. So love it. <laughs> well, uh, maybe it'll maybe it'll appear. Maybe my face will appear in the clouds. Love it. Okay, sounds Thanks, good, Scott. Ben. Take care. Yeah, like Mufasa, like when Simba's <laughs> talking to his dad. Exactly. It'll be Scott out there looking over all of us. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it, man. You got it, guys. Okay, that was Scott Scott Rogowski. Watch that documentary. It sounds interesting. Uh, HQ trivia: the rise and fall glitch. It's going to be out on CNN on Sunday. Check it out. Uh, we have one last bit of show cleanup to do here. I'm excited about this. We have our giveaway of yep. the courtroom sketch from the Epstein episode. With uh, It was done by the guy that made our logo yep. for Macrodose. Francis Barry. Shout out. Francis. King. Is, he is the man. He's very talented. It's a, it's a cool sketch. So we did a one day only giveaway or one day only sale of our 100th episode anniversary shirts. And a lot of you guys bought them. So thank you for that. We appreciate it. We love you guys. We truly do. Shout out all the Macrodosians out there. Um, so we want to give away this courtroom sketch to somebody that bought a shirt and then sent in the receipt to Macrodosing Art Avery. So we're going to do a live drawing right now on the show. I have the list of every single person that sent in this receipt. And I'm on chat GPT right now. I'm going to ask ChatGPT to select one name from the list of people. So I've got all the names ready to go, and we're going to have artificial intelligence pick who gets it. All right. So it's only fair. Copying, I'm pasting right now into ChatGPT. ChatGPT, what do you say? Who wins it? Can you just tell it to randomize it? Yeah. I gave it a list and said, I said, uh, here's the exact input. Can you select one name from this list? And then I gave the full list of people. ChatGPT says, sure. I randomly select Carol Lepisco from the list. Carol Lepisco. I hope I said your name right. L-I-P-I-S-S, excuse me, L-I-P-I-S-Z-K-O. There we go. She's She's on the list, right? I think it's a he. I gotta Carol? look. I gotta double check. Okay. Yeah, like Carol maybe. Maybe Carol. Yeah. Okay. Like Russian. There you go, Billy. <laughs> I yeah, I actually don't know, but is it C A O? Is me, it C A R O L E? Yeah. Let me. No, it's, no, it's K K A R O L. All right, Carol, Carol Lepisco, you have won the courtroom sketch. So, Avery, get back in touch with them, and we will send you that courtroom sketch. He's a he. He's a he. Okay. Yep. Shout out Carol. This is what he sent me. Hey, Avery, here's the receipt for my macrodosing limited edition tea. I'll send it to you on Twitter too in case you didn't see this. Keep up the good work, man. Love what you guys are doing. Well, you just won the sketch, brother. All right. Love you, Carol. Sweet. Did Carole. we ever put the sketch on a t-shirt? Nope. Might have to. Maybe before we lose it. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad idea. Yeah, I'll take a couple 24 pictures. hours. <laughs> yeah. I'll take a couple all right. Well, thank you to every everybody that bought a shirt. We love doing this show. I'm I'm humbled that you guys enjoy listening to it. So appreciate everyone that that bought one of those. Yeah, Billy. How did Atlantis go? Uh, Atlantis went okay. It was. Um, I wish that you had been on for more of it. Yeah, I couldn't figure out what you were trying to say over that text message. Yeah, had. dude, Atlantis. There's there's a lot of real history that could indicate that there was a place that was like atlantis but it was probably just like a you know how like some fantasy is derived from real life mm -hmm. like you know like vlad dracula is based off of vlad the impaler mm -hmm. like 
uh, Plato may have based Atlantis off of a number of ancient Mediterranean civilizations that may have been affected by uh, the Black Sea flooding, which was like post Ice Age, a lot of glacial melting was pooling into the Black Sea, which then may have hit the Caspian Sea and then flooded the Mediterranean, wiping out uh, various uh, trading empires or very big city states that was basically a trading hub. Yeah, that's kind of the conclusion that we came to also, which was if it existed, it was probably in, in the neighborhood of Greece. Yeah. So that Plato would have known about it. Also, while you were gone, I don't know if you were here for this. We talked about draft day two. No, he was not there. Oh, they're com- they're making a draft day two. They are. We are. Yeah. We- oh, we are. Yeah, we are. Oh, so, hell yeah. So we've got Arian attached. He wants to run his character back. <laughs> Oh, sweet. And so we, we got to figure out what happened over the last 10 years since Draft Day came out. He's a GM now? Yeah, that's what we were talking about. That's that. what we were saying. Could, could I... Um, Do you want to be a football player? Could I Could I maybe be like a number one draft pick quarterback coming out? With character issues? <laughs> yeah. Nobody yeah, like went secret. to your birthday Billy's party. like Johnny Manziel. Yeah. <laughs> secret character issues. No, 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 Chad Kelly character issues. Okay. And, but like, good. All right. At football or as a person? No, both. (laughs) Just like troubled. (laughs) Good person, troubled. That's kind of how Arian's character was in that movie. Yeah, a little bit of a hothead. A little bit of a hothead, but he like no, no, he's a he's a no, no, he's like a really bad conspiracy theorist, but like really deep, and that's his one character issue. So you want to be the NFL Kyrie Irving? Well, I like that. Yeah, Yeah, that actually. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) but like no one knows. The media doesn't know, but they find out that he's like deep into some stuff like you're on like 64 chan yeah and then he ends up being right and they <laughs> yeah no no he, he's right but in a weird way so yeah. he thinks the nfl is scripted yes right and oh, then yeah. then they hand him his script and his script is like you're an upstanding member of this community and <laughs> you keep your nose out of uh like weird shit online and then you just be a productive football player for us for 12 years and that's the script that you have sweet. to follow and you're like i'm just playing the script i'm just playing my part sweet all right this is coming together nicely I big like t this. could be a, a ot yeah like a very high value left tackle yeah that this is this this has legs i gotta figure out what i would play in this movie or i'm behind the scenes we'll so, yeah we'll sort this out draft day two coming soon are you the scout yeah, would, what are you? I could be a vaguely European kicker that uh, is on his last legs in the NFL. Okay. What? What is that? Nothing. Say it. Ah, no, no, no worries. You and Arian have like a like a compadre. Like, ah, I get you. I'm like, not very good anymore. No, I, I was thinking you like a, like. Aaron's a GM. You're the scout, and you're just like a lot of banter about these guys. Like you figure out like. This trying dude. to find a role for Glenny Balls. I think he needs to be in the movie somehow. Yes. An owner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, or like a I like the that. son of an owner yeah, Gl- who's Glenn, like taking charge. Glenny takes his only stands money <laughs> and he buys the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. From Haslam. Yeah, I like that. All right. Yeah. Stay tuned. We'll, we'll figure out more of this later. All right. Love you guys.